Assalamu alaikum and welcome to part 2 on Magic Evil Eye in V and the rest. Before going any further, now that we know what we are on about, the magic and the evil eye and envy and possession of uh, the jinn, which I will also cover in details a little bit later, even though the Quran is very clear about magic, evil eye and the envy and everything, but we find Muslims extremely confused today about these issues. The great majority of Muslims are scared of magic. They are scared of evil eye. They are scared of envy. Black magic, pink magic, green pie, name it and it's there and people are scared of it. And they are also scared of the jinn possessing them. And uh, there are so many examples that I can uh, give, but as I said before, that if you find somebody who cannot find a job or is unsuccessful in some business or the woman is not uh, getting what she wants or the family, the husband, things like that, it's easy to throw it on magic that someone out there is magic in them or someone out there is evil envying them or envying them or, or even worse, that one of them too is possessed by the a jinn and someone is controlling them from behind the scenes and this is extremely disturbing and not only that it eats at the belief of a person and that person doesn't know that their belief is being eaten into one thing that all men of religion and when I say men of religion I mean from whoever is considered the highest scholar to the youngest person who takes it upon themselves to preach Islam, including Zaki Naik and uh, uh, the sort. And I also talk about any sects that exist within Islam. They all agree without any shadow of doubt that the Quran is the primary source of legislation, guidance, belief, and everything that Allah wants from a humans in Islam. Then different sects go on adding other sources that they accept and then because of that we have a huge battles. For example, the Hanafi school of thoughts agrees with everyone else that the Quran is number one. But number two is Abu Hanifa. Number three is this. Number four is that. And the other school of thoughts also agree on the Quran. No problem. And then they have their own sources. And that's where the problems are. Instead of sticking to the one source Somebody somewhere has magicked uh, the Muslim Ummah into inventing all sources and I consider them all, apart the Qur'an, sources of evil. The Muslims, how, how did we manage to add the Hadith on top of the Qur'an when we know that Allah stated in the Qur'an in a very concise, clear, powerful, and loud manner وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَصَّلْنَاهُ تَفْصِيلًا And everything i.e. that Muslims need we have explained inside the Quran everything in detail in another translation it says and everything we have explained in detail and we have expounded everything in detail and everything we have expounded with a clear expounded and all things have we explained in details and we have explained everything in detail with full explanation this should have been enough because this is the Quran Allah states directly that he's done everything we don't need anything extra this ayah is in Surah Al-Isra. Surah Al-Isra was revealed in the early days in Mecca. It means from that day Allah has explained everything and in details and it should remain as such until the day Muhammad dies. This is in Surah Al-Isra and in ayah 51. One thing we have to understand my dear sisters and my brothers is this kind of uh, Allah is the only one when he wants to do whatever he pleases he does it you see you and me we are restricted I wish right now I am in some hot places in Hawaii enjoying a good time I wish now but I cannot be right now here I cannot go there in a split of a second however if Allah wants me to go there he can take me in a split of a second from here to there an end of it. 
See, when Allah said, he explained in detail, expounded, made clear and everything, he, <laughs> he made sure that we understand that he didn't say this in a very clumsy manner. So now the question remains then, why did our sheikh and scholars ignore this clear text? Why did they add other sources? And because of the other sources, we have the Shia, we have this school of thoughts, we have that group, uh, we have the Sunni, we have the Salafi, we have the Ash'ari, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have. You see, any answer that someone gives to, to explain why will be as bad and as evil as any other. No matter what the justification they give, it shall be just pure ever. It's evil. Did Allah mention this ayah truthfully? Or did he just trick us? Of course Allah spoke truth. And he always speaks the truth. In fact, he did mention elsewhere in the Quran another ayah far more clear than the clearest of the clear. He goes, وَقَدْ فَصَّلَ لَكُمْ مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ And he, i.e. Allah, has explained to you what he has forbidden for you. In other words, what Allah has forbidden for us is clear. He explained it in the Quran. The sheikhs, they tell you, yes, he explained it in the Sunnah as well. And now, if the Sunnah is Allah's revelation, why isn't it then put in books like the Quran? Why can't we just read it like the Quran and pray with it? If you tell me what the Messenger Muhammad said in the Hadith is a religion, is a revelation from Allah, why doesn't it have the same status as the Quran? Since the Quran is the word of Allah revealed to Muhammad. And if you tell me that the Hadith is the revelation of Allah to Muhammad, then they tell you, no, 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 no. And it's true. They will say no. They will tell you the Hadith is what the Messenger of Allah understood from the Quran. Oh, so it's not a revelation. Now it's his point of view. They will tell you yes. And his point of view is valid. And I will tell you no, it's not valid. It was valid in his time. But not in our time. And uh, this is a long headache you get. Watch this one. I want you to concentrate on this. Why I try, why I am not trying, why I am uh, bringing the Quran and the validity of the Quran because I need and you need this later on when it comes to speak about why magic doesn't exist, why evil I don't exist, and why envy doesn't exist, and why a jinn or a shaitan possessing a human being does not exist. If you don't believe in the Quran, anything else I'm going to say won't get into your head. Because now, like the signal of your satellite TV, the signal is not strong and is not clear. That's why you cannot have one channel. So now it's either you take the Quran and what Allah says in the Quran that in which he explained everything, or you go with the Quran and what uh, Muhammad understood and what the Sheikh understood and we end up in a very confused state. Well, one day in year 10 before the death of the Prophet Muhammad he did something that he didn't in the early days. He went for Hajj and before going to Hajj they sent news all around the peninsula, the Arabian, everywhere. Muhammad is going to perform Hajj. And what happened was something extremely interesting. A huge number of the Arabs went straight away to Mecca to meet the messenger there. Why? They wanted to perform Hajj with him. Books say that the number of these people was between 100,000 and 124,000 believers at Hajj. In other words, the Messenger of Allah was with this huge number. And when they performed Hajj, towards the end of Hajj with that huge number, and the Messenger of Allah was given, when he was talking to them, he would talk, and then you find a man maybe 40 rows later, he relays what the Messenger of Allah, and that's how they used to do, they used to relay what the Messenger of Allah. On that very day, in, with that huge number of people, Allah reveals the following ayah. Today, I have finished for you 
your religion وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي and have completed on you my favor وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا and have now approved and I am pleased for you this Islam which you have today which back then was solely on the Quran nothing else as your religion this declaration that should have been tattooed on the forehead of every Muslim was revealed to the uh, to, to Muhammad the messenger was in the last 10 weeks of his life with 100,000 to 124,000 people witnessing that Al-Islam has been completed and it has been finished and Allah is happy with it and we have the seal of approval that Al-Islam from now on is complete nothing else in other words my sisters and my brothers back then in year 10 few days or maybe few weeks before the death of Muhammad Al-Islam was as such finished, completed, pleased equals Islam there is actually no better signature from Allah than this it's a digital signature where you don't find someone scribbling the name they just write their name and that's your signature Al-Islam is finished completed and Allah is pleased equals Islam if I wanted to turn this ayah into a mathematical equation I would say it this way Islam equals finished plus completed time pleased power two because you have to talk to the pleased has to go with finished and completed and that's the pleasing of Allah and this is mind-boggling if Allah had completed finished and approved and is happy with Islam as it was at the time of Muhammad before his death how come 200 over 200 years later the hadith was born and was pushed in into something that was already completed finished and that's how we messed up our Islam because this close Islam closing declaration signature was issued in Mecca during that Hajj, the last Hajj, the last few days because there are weeks before the, uh, the death of Muhammad the number of the believers was the highest ever so much so that in a hadith reported by Muslim Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah and a plethora, a huge number of other scholars and they qualified as authentic they said that one of the narrator called Jabir Jabir, he said, when I stood in front of the messenger, like the messenger stood, and the messenger was on an elevated platform, he said, this man said, I looked in front of me, and I could not see, it was everything, all filled in with humans, until the end of my eyesight, meaning, he could, see, he would just keep seeing humans, and he goes, and when I turn to the, my right, it was a pool of people with no end to my left the same thing and behind me I wanted to imagine that look at the you are on elevated platform and the number of people in front of you does not end and on that very particular moment Allah reveals that today I have completed Al Islam for you I have terminated it and I am pleased for it to be your religion and by the way the term religion comes from the word relation relation religion relation religion that's how we ended up into a religion because it's a special relationship with Allah they call it a religion uh, at the beginning it started with uh, so as you can see from a hundred thousand to hundred and twenty four thousand passing by hundred and fourteen thousand so the number is big two hundred years Muslims living with no hadith, no sunnah, no this or that school of thoughts, no this or that sheikhs. To them at that moment there was what Allah knows, what, uh, sorry, what Allah said, and people read it and they followed that. And in the third century, a bunch of people put their hands together and corrupted Al-Islam until our times so much so that when we ask people to follow the Quran alone we became deviated and that is very strange because when they say 
If you, my brother, who is Salafi and whatever, if you believe that Allah is the Almighty, the All-Knowing, the utmost and absolute decider and ruler, and he has declared that the Quran and the relationship between us and him, the religion, is completed and terminated. And upon that, Allah is pleased with it. Why did we add what you added? Why are you nowadays telling me that whatever Muhammad says is part of Islam? And when we know that came over 200 years later. My dear sisters and my brother, this paper will be based on the Quran and the Quran all alone. There is nothing else. When I mention a hadith narrative, I just mention it because that's what they said, not what I believe in. I am very secure, at ease, perfectly in harmony with myself in believing in the Quran all alone. I can defend that argument, I can defend that, and alhamdulillah, so far no one ever beat me in the argument, sheikh or no sheikh. Because once you start talking with the Quran, no hadith shall stand in front of it, because the hadith world is so full of contradictions, so full of confused statement. And when you talk to people and you know these contradictions and you bring them to the table, you beat them easily. So, now I'm going to get to the big surprise of this talk. Because we're talking about magic, evil eye, and envy, and the gym possession, right? Well, the big surprise I want you to have is this. Magic, evil eye, and the envy are nothing but one thing said differently. Magic, evil eye, and envy are just like the tentacles of an octopus. It's the same animal. If disbelief had a body, magic will be one leg, the evil, uh, evil eye will be the other leg, envy will be the third leg, and the jinn will be the fourth uh, leg. I'm thinking of a cat. Why? Because magic is something that relies on you achieves to something to harm somebody else. The means you call on some uh, hidden forces to do that. All right. Evil eye is also the art of relying on something you don't see to achieve harm for someone else. You see there in your evil eye there, and you hope something happens between you and the other person that's going to harm them. And envy is the same thing. You rely on something you don't see to harm somebody else. You see there and you wish the wife or the girlfriend or the money of somebody else. Go ahead, envy the whole day. Ain't nothing that's going to happen. So the three magic, evil eye and envy, are nothing but one big disbelief, as we shall see later on. Let me mention to you a few things about this magic in the world of Salafism, in the world of the Hadith, so to speak, because they are important to us. For example, in this Hadith, and this Hadith is authentic, Bukhari and Muslim, and as I said before, when a Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim to the Salafi world. It, that hadith is as good as the Quran and many, many times better than the Quran. What does this hadith say? Well, it's easy. The Messenger of Allah is reported to say the following. He who starts his day with seven dates, ajwa dates, and these are days of al Madina will not be harmed by poison or magic. The hadith is clear. Anyone who starts their day eating seven days from al Madina, from the Ajwa, it's the only date anyway, then that person on that day cannot be harmed by poison or magic. Simple. Do you know why? Well, it's simple really. I'm going to ask the biggest sheikh, and I used this argument before, with the sheikh. He goes, yeah, and I said, could you swear that this hadith is authentic? He goes, I swear to Allah that this hadith is authentic. And I told him, I'll bring you seven dates from the Ajwa. And I'm going to get you some cyanide poison or some serine poison, the most potent killing uh, poison that you uh, die. Look, you put the pill or you take something in your mouth of the cyanide or the serine, few seconds, just enough for your body to digest them, you fall. 
because that's it, they go to the heart and they stop breathing and that's it, you die on the spot, right? No problem. Have them date and come to me and I'll give you cyanide and I'm gonna cross my arms and look at you fall like a rat. And once somebody dies, it means the hadith is a lie. Because the hadith says with full mouth, like it's almost like it's the Quran. If you eat seven dates, no poison and no magic shall touch you. The problem with this is this. This kind of hadith was put at one point so that somebody who sells dates can have his merchandise go since Muslims were scared of poison and magic. Especially after the death of Rasulullah, using poison to kill people was a norm. After all, uh, Al Hassan was killed uh, poisoned, and few other companions, few other members of the household of the Messenger were killed with poison. And it stayed until our, uh, in the Muslim world, I mean, in the Khilaf, what they call, until the end and the fall of it. In another hadith, Aisha states that the Prophet was so bewitched until he began to imagine he had done something while in fact he had not done it. So that is the power of magic. So why didn't the magic, uh, the prophet take the dates? Why didn't he eat them? So was this hadith of the dates revealed to him after he fell poisoned? In which case, sorry Allah, a few, few months or few years late. And if you, ya Allah, knew ahead of time that these dates would stop from magic why didn't you give them to the prophet before why did you let him go through the magic bay and then, of course it's a lie the prophet never ever was touched by magic this is a lie but that's how our books say if someone wants to do the Ahmed Didat thing or the Zaki Naik thing where you look at the books of the people of the book and you find things that don't work and you tell them oh you've got error here you've got error there I can do that with hadith I can spend the rest of my life just bringing the confusion and the contradictions of the hadith it's so it's almost like the, the, the molecules of oxygen in the air you don't need to look for them they are there you just have to know them and that's it and then you find the things they tell you the messenger of Allah told us to avoid the seven mubiqat. Mubiqat are the things that will uh, certainly drive you into hellfire. Someone asked them, what are they? So it's always Hollywood, they think. It's always, but anyhow, they could have just said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. What? But anyhow, and he said to them, ashirku billah, associating anything with Allah, fine. Magic and killing people. So the prophet, the problem with magic was big at the time. So why was the prophet, why do they say that he was insulted? Of course this is a lie, but that is what we are dealing with. Always remember that. In another hadith, Aisha reports that the messenger of Allah, whenever he fell sick, what would he do? He would call upon Jibreel to come down and, and uh, to, to cure him. How would Jibril do? Does he bring you like painkillers? No. Jibril comes in and he starts saying that, and he starts reading the Quran, he writes, making dua and things like that. And this is by Bukhari, Muslim, and everyone. Jibril would say, in the name of Allah, may he cure you from all kinds of illnesses and safeguard you from the evil of the envier when he expresses envy and from the evil of influence of eye or the evil eye that's what Jibreel said despite this the messenger was insulted sorry Jibreel that didn't work didn't work problems of life we have so many problems let me now tell you why it's a problem because Abraham in the Quran when he declared he said and when I fall sick he, Allah, heals me. But Muhammad, when he gets sick, he calls Jibreel. And Jibreel makes dua for him. In between the two, Abraham wins. In another hadith, the Arabs came to messenger, to the messenger, and told him, Ya Rasulullah, ala natadawa, messenger of Allah. When we fall sick, should we treat ourselves? Should we sick? And then he goes, yes, people of Allah. Yes, 
Do use remedies. Go cure yourself. Find remedies. For indeed, Allah did not create a disease without creating its cure or its remedy. Meaning each, thing, each time we have a disease, we look for the cure. And that's exactly what's happening. This hadith is reported by Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and a plethora a great number of other people. This hadith is authentic. But this hadith creates a problem for us. You see, when the people, the Arabs and the believers come to the Rasulullah and they say, when we fall sick, what do we do? Shall we treat ourselves? He goes, yes, go look for treatment. Because every disease has its, okay, no problem. But he, when he falls sick, he calls Jibreel. He doesn't look for... It's hypocritical. Why don't you call Jibreel for us? Or if you command us to go seek treatment, why don't you do it yourself? Especially that we know that Allah has threatened in Al-Quran, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفَعَلُونَ كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفَعَلُونَ All you who believe... Why do you say what you do not do? It is most despised to Allah that you say that which you do not do. And the Prophet Muhammad would fall into this one head on. And despise is not like I don't like you, I don't love you, no. Despise is far more potent and more powerful. But what can we say? So in these two equations, what would you put Rasulullah? In somebody who says what he does? Or in somebody who says what he doesn't do? You go seek your uh, cure, go look for it and look for the cure because Allah has decided to search for it. But me when I fall sick, Jibreel come to me. Huh, it's not. But you know, let's go back to black magic and magic and general evil eye and things like that. Magic, evil eye and envy are a big source in the heart because they bring a lot of fear to people. The thing is, this fear is nothing central. It's not like just for the Muslims. It's around the world. And especially the religious world because in every religion, be that Judaism, Christianity, the current versions of Islam, version of Islam that we have, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, and all kinds of religion, each and every one of them have their own sacred test to prove that magic, evil eye, and envy exist. And that they can use them to hurt people. And as such, every one of these religions, Judaism, Christianity, our Islam, the Hinduism, the Sikhism, Buddhism, every one of these people has in their sacred texts how to cure people from magic, evil eye and envy. So, you go to the church, you find people. Go to the church and you will see people, uh, the ghost hunters or the evil spirit hunter. And they go to a building that is possessed and they fight Lucifer and the jinn to kick them out from there. The Jews, they have plenty of this. The, the Buddhists and the Sikhs and the Hindus and oh God, the number, we Muslims, tons of it. But when a Sikh is possessed by a jinn, or when a Buddhist is possessed by a jinn, it shouldn't be a problem, right, if they went to a Jew or Christian. But no, they wouldn't go there because they don't believe that the texts of the Jews and Christians are as sacred as theirs. And per se, their sacred texts are the ones that will kick the jinn out. The believers in the Bible, the Christians believe the same thing. They will, you will never ever hear a possessed Christian call upon a Muslim sheikh to read him the Quran. No, it ain't gonna work. You need the Bible. And this is the whole thing is just a hoax upon a hoax upon a hoax. And we'll see later on why it is a hoax. So the, these, these hadiths that I just mentioned and the statement of the sheikhs and all that kind of stuff are at the source of the confusion of people. Not only that, they say to be considered as a Muslim, you must believe that magic, evil eye and envy are true. Why? Because of the hadith and the ayah and the Qur'an, when in fact the Qur'an doesn't say that. The Qur'an fights magic, evil eye, 
and in the end, the humans being possessed by Shaitan, everything he fights them and he fights them good. But the problem is, these hadith narratives and school of thoughts are what are clouding the Quran and the text. And it's, and, and it's really uh, sad news. I just want to think, I'm going to throw in some logical thinking into this process, yeah? They say the success of magic depends on employing the powers of the dark side. No, Ya Allah, it makes me, uh, it makes me sound like uh, Star Wars, Darth Vader and all. But, okay, they say if magic, if you want magic to succeed, you are going to need to work with the dark side, the jinn, the devils. Now the question is uh, this, if I need the jinn to do this job to hurt you, or a woman, I don't want her to give birth to children, so I'm going to go to this magician and ask him to call upon the jinn. And so that he can write a talisman for me or a spell. And I put it on that woman and she never give birth to a child. It means what the jinn have done is so powerful that it can influence humans of, of uh, the, the lives of humans. The jinn could write a spell and I'll never get a job. Or the jinn can and can and can. Right? Well, guess what? If the jinn could do this, then certainly shaitan, who is the chief jinn that, have, that is the most powerful of all the jinn, the evil ones. Shaitan is also at the head. When he uses magic, he can wreak havoc. Problem is, why doesn't shaitan use the tool of magic? against us as humans. Why is he wasting his time running around like a headless chicken whispering to this one, to that one, to this one and he's just whispering. He can do nothing. He just whispers, whispers, whispers in the hope that you'd listen to him and sin. And someone might spend 10 years sinning, stealing money, fornicating, drinking, right? And the shaitan is just whispering after whispers of the whisper. Then after 10 years, that person feels bad about himself and his own soul would kind of blame him. And then they decide, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to repent to Allah and be a good Muslim. Shaitan has just lost 10 years of his life. Do you think if shaitan could do magic, he wouldn't use it? He would. And not a single human being on earth would escape a shaitan. And then it would be another problem. On top of him whispering to us, he's good at magic. He doesn't need a human to summon him to go perform some spells against people. He would use them at free will. Shaitan would be holding sales conferences amongst the jinn. Come and I'll teach you how to do magic and how to ruin the life of these humans. Just like I ruined the life of Adam when I kicked him out from the garden. Come here. Let me tell you how you do it. And you're going to do it and do it good. Do you think Shaitan... I don't know how, why people are idiots. Really, I don't. And I don't talk about you. I, I talk about these sheikhs and all these people. How can you sell something in order for magic to succeed? You need the devils. You need the jinn. Okay. If the jinn could do magic, certainly the shaitan is their best. If shaitan is their best, why is he just restricted to whispering? I pray to Allah this is clear. Because a shaitan who has spent... Only Allah knows how much time into tempting Adam to do something. To disobey Allah, to approach the tree, to do all that. He, if shaitan was able to do magic, I personally, I would just imagine him one day sitting elsewhere with a, with a wand in his hand. Abracadabra, Adam, I paralyze you. I'm going to hypnotize you. Walk to the tree, eat from it. That's it, my magic is working. Ha 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 ha, come out. Now, if shaitan cannot use magic, ain't nobody else that can. And this is why when Allah kicked Adam and his partner and a shaitan from the garden, he told them, Descend from it, and the descent is not from, he from heaven to earth. It's from some place, where are you? Go oh, I'm going downtown. Look at the term downtown. 
all right because we use the downtown because the people live uptown so it's just uh, those who live in uptown they're gonna go down to town and this is what Allah uses the downtown it's not the descent from but anyhow you get the point in another ayah Allah says to them so Allah here establishes the relationship between us and the shaitan and whoever is in his party is that we are enemies to one another this is why the only thing that shaitan can do is the west west the west west is thoughts planting whispers he puts in your mind he, and that is if you listen to him he starts doing it if you don't listen to him even to get your attention he is not capable of he, Allah didn't give that to a shaitan a shaitan cannot touch a human a shaitan cannot possess a human he cannot have sex or any kind of flirt with a human he cannot force a human to do as he pleases either through magic or not he cannot do magic anyway a shaitan cannot appear to a human being shaitan cannot speak to a human being he cannot interfere or change the course of action or life of a human being except through whispers and you listen and the human being listening to those whispers and act on them a shaitan cannot invent things from nothing and he cannot turn your thoughts into things if magic could harm a shaitan would have been the first to use it since he has access to us our lives and everything we belong to see if that Rabid uh, ibn al-Asam who insulted Rasulullah took his comb with some hair and then they do they add some things from the dead and put some some elements there some talismans there and then abracadabra come Mr. Jinn say your evil stuff and the jinn comes blah 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 blah, blah and that this now is a magic spell guess what a shaitan could come to your house and pick up anything you got he has access to that but he cannot because the only thing shaitan can do is spare and of it nothing else if evil eye could harm all the shaitan has to do is sit on a chair and evil eye in our butt till the cows come home evil eye this evil eye that that's it all he has go go to know to, to, to new york city and just sit there and evil eye them why do you talk to them you can evil eye them end of it if a envy could harm shaitan would have been the first to use it you see when shaitan envied adam he didn't sit there and just envy 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 oh adam i envy 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 now he put it into action and that is the envy that is disastrous it's when someone envies you and puts that into action to take what you got because they believe that they, be, they believe it belongs to them again if magic evil eye envy could be could harm a human being shaitan would have been the first to use them against humanity if possessing a humans was possible guess what shaitan would have been the first to use it yeah allah yeah allah no one would ever escape a shaitan because he can spend the night in me night in you and that in that night i can go and kill and then i'll be in jail and that's it, my life is ruined in one night i can do so much damage and my life is now a shaitan cannot do magic evil eye in the opposite a human and if the devil cannot do that those dark forces that are called to perform magic cannot and that's why magic does not exist not a thing in the muslim world sadly 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 when they wanted to define magic guess what they took what a one of their scholars whose name is ibn qudama al-maqdis ibn qudama this man was born in the holy land i really don't like to call it palestine i don't like to call it israel i call it the holy land because uh but anyhow because of the conflicts and because the quran has a different point of view we call it the holy land or the blessed land ibn qudama was from that part and he is of the sixth hijri century for us in our think he was of the 
12th century. He died in Syria in Damascus. But anyhow, this man said the following about how he defines uh, Sihar. And the reason his word is important because he, his book, uh, Al Mughni, Al Mughni meaning he wrote a book that would put you, you don't need any other book except that book. It's not the Quran, it's his book. And that's the book, the Hanbali School of Thought, which today is spread in Saudi Arabia also is the religion of the Salafis. When you say Salafi, you are saying Hanbali. 100%. But in, that's why you have different versions of Salafism. But what this man said is what is today considered as the definition of Sihar, magic. He said, magic is talismans, spells, and tying knots that affect hearts and bodies to cause sickness and lead to death. It can also separate a man from his wife and take one of the spouses from their companion. So in the Muslim uh, end of his uh, end of quote. So according to Ibn Qudama and what is believed out there, the magic is talismans and spells that someone says and does and then the result or tying knots and whispering them and say some stuff in them as I said they call on the evil jinn to do that and then the result is that the hearts and bodies of other people are affected they get sick and also they cause a man to separate from his wife you know what the problem is with all this yeah, if I am going to be a magician, why don't I enrich myself? Why am I wasting my time separating between a man and his wife? Why? Why is magic always linked to separating a couple? Why? And I'll tell you later on when we discuss Suleiman and the kingdom of Suleiman and the magic and all that kind of stuff, we're going to talk and you're going to see why all this is taking place. So this is an anomaly. And Nawawi is another scholar also highly respected in the Salafi world, he said the following. He said that all scholars, all scholars, and that is when he mentioned like the correct opinion about the definition of sihr. He said that sihr or magic are real. And then he said this is the opinion which is agreed by the majority of scholars and by the general group of scholars and they all agree upon it. So based on this thing here, as Mr. Annawi uh, said, that the sihr is true and it has a reality, it exists. And this is what the group of scholars are 110% sure about that. And I will tell him you are 192% wrong, you and every other scholar out there. And this is what gets to my mind. As you will see later on with the evidence and the Quran and all that kind of stuff, you will see why these arguments aren't and cannot be true. But they are out there and every sheikh believes in the two statements. The, uh, the one of Ibn Qudama and what an nawawi said. That sihr is talisman, spells, uh, try, uh, try knots, whispering in them, separating husband and wives, causing people to fall sick and that kind of stuff. They believe in them just as you believe in Allah being one. So, let me take you a little bit back in time, yeah? Because when shaitan decided to disobey Allah's command, you know, in the famous story of Adam and the angels and things like that, and by the way, the, 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 the debate that took place between Allah and a shaitan, it was not a debate where shaitan is standing in front of Allah and talk. It didn't happen like that. It happened through revelation. Here's what the shaitan said, and then he reveals to them, then a shaitan would say something else, and, 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 and things like that. So that's how it took place. So when a shaitan decided to disobey Allah from yielding to Adam, just like the angels did, he a shaitan asked of Allah to grant him a life till the end of this life. And guess what? Allah granted him that wish. He then asked Allah to give him big powers to misguide humans. And Allah declined and only allowed him one thing. Whispering the was was nothing else. So if shaitan for himself cannot create, uh, do magic, he cannot give it to somebody else. Because what you don't got, you can't give it to somebody else. So when shaitan angrily declared war on us, 
inadvertently, without intending, he gave us his strategy on how to misguide us or hurt us or harm us. Not once did a shaitan mention that he will physically hurt us or that he will do magic on us or evil eye or envy or any of that kind of stuff on us. A shaitan took certain steps and Allah blew his cover. Allah says, A shaitan promises you poverty and orders you to commit sexual debaucheries or obscenities. So you see, a shaitan only promises nothing. There is nothing that a shaitan can do that will make your life good. He is our enemy. And that should sink in our hearts. And him being our sworn enemy, since he cannot produce magic for himself, he cannot produce it for our humans. So what did the shaitan do? It's easy really. He said, I shall certainly take to myself, for hellfire of course, a due share from the people you created. And he's talking to Allah. And then he said, And I shall endeavor to mislead them. And I shall tempt them. They will always live in hopes and dream lands. And that was always the truth. Mislead, misguide, and create false hopes. And that's the invitation to sin. Did he mention anywhere here that he could do magic or evil Ayas or envious or do no he did not. And that's why Allah says, And whoever takes a shaitan as his leader away from Allah, then he has indeed suffered a tremendous loss in this life and in the hereafter. Ya'iduhum wa yumanniyim. He, i.e. Allah is speaking about the shaitan, a shaitan promises them and he makes them hope. But shaitan promises them only deception. Yes, only de Notice how Allah summarizes the job of a shaitan into promises and making false hopes. Do you think the killer who murdered a young woman after raping her, do you think before he committed the act, he thought one spit of a second, oh my God, I'm going to get caught and I'm going to go to jail for the rest of my life. No. He thought he's going to be able to commit the crime and get away with it. That's why he did it. When a thief comes at night and breaks into a house to steal, do you think he thinks like, oh my God, I'm going to get caught. That's it. I'm going to go to jail. No. He comes at night with the hope that he's going to break in take money and get away. Yes, he is cautious, but the idea of him going to jail is a far remote one. And that is how shaitan works with people. He decorates the act, he creates false confidence and sends the person, and then the person, guess what? I, I follow some documentaries on uh, murders and I find it extremely disturbing that a man like yesterday, a young man of 28 or 29, I saw this and uh, with a friend of his, a female and then he says one of my, uh, what do they call that? one of my fantasies, sexual fantasies is to rape an 8 years old girl when they caught him, he had 17 gigabytes of child pornography on his, uh, on his uh, computer. And then the girl said, okay, sweetheart, I'm going to make your fantasy come true. They hijacked an eight years, extremely intelligent, beautiful young girl from school. The girl spoke to the young girl and she said, I've got a puppy. I can show it to you. It's in the door. Do you want it? She goes, yeah, I want a dog. And the girl went and there was no dog and they got her in the car. And then they took the car to a secluded place in some mountain there. And then, and then the girl, the girlfriend, she didn't want to witness what's going to happen. She left him with the young eight years uh, in the car. And then he, the monster that he is, he rapes the eight. Oh, God Almighty. Oh, oh. 
Uh, he rapes the young girl, and then once he's done with her sexually, he strangles her, he kills her. He kills her. And then he gets caught. And he starts crying and seeking sympathy. And I didn't mean to kill her. No, you, you meant to kill her. It's just Shaitan came at the very first time and he made you promises. If you sleep with the girl, it's going to be great fun. You're going to fulfill fantasy. He sold you false hopes and you listened to him and you went with him and you ended up with nothing. If Shaitan could do magic, he would have put a spell on that kid and any one of us is a rapist. Any one of us is a killer. Any one of us is another living shaitan. But that is not like that. There are... Allah has mentioned another thing that should have rang tons of bells for our sheikhs and everyone else. And that thing there is pretty simple. Once people enter hellfire, the shaitan will sit them down just as a sheikh on, on a Friday would have people sit down in front of him and he will climb the member as a sheikh would do except what's going to happen is inside hellfire and then shaitan will deliver one of the most uh, sincere statement that he will ever speak and in his sincerity is the hugest the biggest calamity that humans will face and that is eternity in her fire and this statement that shaitan shall speak on judgment day inside her fire is already with us today on earth and shaitan will not be given an uh, option to say different than what is in the quran an acknowledgement from a shaitan that he is a loser who did his best at make humanity lose and since you are with him in hellfire and you can hear the statement he's going to give then eternity is also for you on part three i will start with what a shaitan said and we go through there and nowhere in what the khutbah or the sermon that he's going to give in hellfire has magic evil eye envy or possessing the humans it only has promises, false hopes. That's it. That's what it has. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam, and this is the end of part two. And now I'm off to part three. Salam.